Hello, good afternoon and welcome to the very first of these Wild Lives. This will be a monthly gathering where we come together and uh, hosted by the Wildlife Trust to really discuss the issues that really matter most to you around wildlife and putting nature into recovery here in the UK. And we're delighted that we've got a great panel together for the first of these this afternoon and also delighted that over 1,700 people have registered to watch this live this afternoon and participate in the discussion. So we're delighted with that first initial response. Now, we had to think quite carefully about what should be the topic of the very first of these wild lives, but actually I think the answer was staring us in the face. Uh, over the last three months, of course, the whole country has been going through this very difficult period with lockdown because of the coronavirus a very, very difficult period for so many. But perhaps one of the strange silver linings in an otherwise appalling time through this lockdown is that the evidence that people have actually been using it to get closer to nature and particularly closer to the nature where people live. That's really important for us at the Wildlife Trust. So the Wildlife Trust, we actually uh, operate and manage uh, more reserves, more nature reserves than McDonald's has got restaurants in the UK. In fact, 1,000 more nature reserves and McDonald's has got restaurants in the UK and 60% of the British population live within a three mile walk of a Wildlife Trust nature reserve. And we care passionately about the role that nature can play in improving and maintaining people's physical and mental well-being. And we know that's been incredibly important over the last three months during this period of lockdown. So it was obvious to us that the theme for the first of these should be exactly around that, the role that nature can play in maintaining and improving our physical and mental well-being. And I have to tell you, we've managed to put together a brilliant panel for the conversation this afternoon. We're going to hear from Ruth Sutherland, who's Chief Executive of the Samaritans and also a member of council for us at the Wildlife Trust. We're going to also hear from Dr. Amir Khan, who is a much-loved GP rising to fame through Channel 5's Behind Closed Doors. He's also an ambassador for us at the Wildlife Trust. I think it's fair to say, Amir, he's a, a prolific tweeter on everything nature and well-being related, and he's also an advocate for pre green prescribing. So it's going to be great to hear from Amir. Um, we've also got Rhoda Wilkinson joining us. Uh, Rhoda is an employee with the Lancashire Wildlife Trust and has been with Lancashire Wildlife Trust for three years now, managing the My Place programme for Lancashire Wildlife Trust, uh, but also joined by Connor Hudson, who's again an employee with Lancashire Wildlife Trust, but previously was a participant on My Place. So you'll be hearing from both Connor and Rhoda a lot more about an example of a particular local wildlife trust that's been doing a lot of work on this agenda. And last, but definitely not least, we have Dom Higgins, who's our very own Head of Health and Education at the Wildlife Trusts. So we've got a lot to get through. I'm delighted to say, as I said, over 1,700 people have participated, uh, are registered to participate this afternoon. And we wanna to get to as many of your questions and comments as possible. So I'm gonna to go to each of the participants just to give a five minute introduction to this theme from each of them. And then we're gonna try and get to your questions and comments, uh, which you can submit, of course, in the live chat uh, this afternoon, if you're registered. But first of all, let's come back to Ruth, who, as I said, Chief Executive of the Samaritans and a council member of the Wildlife Trusts. Ruth, we'd love to hear from you why you think nature is so important for people's physical and mental well-being. Great. Well, thank you, Craig. And it's a real pleasure to be here, to be part of this discussion. And I'm thrilled that you've chosen health to be top of the top of the list. Um, it, so a couple of uh, introductory remarks from me, really. It was the World Health Organization in 1946, so some time ago, that defined health as being the state of complete physical, mental, social well-being, and not merely the absence uh, of disease. And so it is the case with mental health, a vital part of what it is to be healthy. Um, we can't have health without mental health. It's all part of the same thing. And certainly our mental health is more than the absence of an illness. We all have mental health and increasingly we're understanding the importance of what it takes to look after and nurture that. But it was also the World Health Organization that said that health was a fundamental right for all. And that must be another thing that guides us in our work. 
whilst there's been a lot of commentary and, and a lot of things have happened since 1946, I think the essence of what was established then is crucial to our discussion um, now. Health is certainly global. Health is a complex set of interrelationships of a huge number of factors, including the environment that we live in. And it is, health is also a right, and it is the responsibility of governments, of individuals, and the organizations that we inhabit. It's much more than the NHS, much more than we can do. We don't simply exist like marbles in a box, you know, all self-contained. We are much more connected than that. Like cells, you know, there's an interconnection um, and uh, it, we're social animals. We are connected to each other. We're programmed to thrive and to live in groups. Solitary confinement is not a torture and a punishment for no reason. It is that we hate it. It's really bad for us. We don't like it. COVID has given us a complete body shock. Um, it's forced us to change and adapt rapidly. It, lots of things beyond our control that we don't really like. It's forced us into social isolation. But I think it's also made us understand what's really important to us, what really matters. Human connection is vital for our health and well-being. But if I could just make a quick point about loneliness, it is um, different from social isolation. Uh, loneliness is a, a personal experience. You can be lonely in a relationship. You can be lonely in a crowd. You can also be very socially isolated and not feel lonely at all. Many people turn to nature because they prefer the company of animals and insects and plants to people at some times in their life, and that's fine. Uh, it's just whatever works for you is the most important thing. Um, lots of people, um, uh, so I think that um, different groups have been affected by COVID in different ways. And it's understanding some of that difference, which should guide us in what to do now. As I said, there have been some positives. The value of relationships and nature is really important. But if feelings of loneliness and isolation persist over time, um, it can pose a significant risk um, to our health and well-being. More from Amir on that uh, later. But suffice to say, at this point, Samaritans, we receive about 7,000 calls a day. That's like 5 million a year. Um, uh, of, and that social isolation and loneliness are really at the top of that. What we've seen over COVID has been that people with existing mental health problems are finding it more and more difficult as COVID goes on. We're finding people with existing conditions, anxiety, OCD, things like that, it's that much worse. And as time goes on, it is impacting people worse. But then there are people with everyday um, concerns, which we're also seeing. Um, uh, much more. Interestingly, quite a big increase in self-help and people looking for self-help materials, and that helps us. I just draw out a couple of groups that are particularly affected. Young people, uh, we were concerned about the mental health of this generation of young people before COVID. We should be even more concerned now. COVID has created an interruption to important transitions important um, support mechanisms like friends and being able to um, move on and leave home and all of those kind of things. Um, I think that um, low-income middle-aged men, for example, are at high risk from suicide. They're the highest risk group. That group will be impacted more by, in, the, by COVID than, than other groups as recession starts to bite. So we need to be concerned um, there. I think one final point I would make is just about inequalities. Uh, it cannot be that access to nature is only for privileged groups. Um, COVID has impacted unequally across people. Disadvantaged groups are also disadvantaged in health outcome. What can we do to this great health asset that we have, which is nature? What can we do to level that up? 
How can we make sure that all ethnic groups have equal access and equal opportunity to connecting with nature and getting the health benefits? As far as I'm um, concerned, um, this is a, a, um, a, a social and intergenerational justice issue that we need to act upon. We now know, and you're gonna hear the evidence now, but we know that health uh, is, um, human connection is vital, connection to nature is vital to our health and well-being. We have this health asset on our doorstep, as Craig told us, on our doorstep. Why would we not make it available, particularly at this time when people need it more than anything? Thanks. Thank you, Ruth, very much. And uh, you've set us off very well for this conversation this afternoon. So uh, Ruth has sort of laid down the challenge there for Amir, I think. <laughs> uh, Amir, uh, to set you up nicely. Yeah, please, perhaps, can you just summarise for us, what is the, some of the science and evidence around uh, the role that nature can play in, in, in maintaining people's physical and mental health? And perhaps also tell us about your own personal experiences of connecting with nature. Amir. Mm. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm a GP, a doctor, and, and if I'm going to prescribe things to my patients, they really have to be evidence-based, which is why I was really interested to learn uh, about the science and the evidence behind green prescribing and being around nature uh, for, for our health. And actually, it, it was a no-brainer. You know, the evidence is, is huge and, and vast and widespread and worldwide, really, for being in nature, being around nature, uh, and how that has a positive impact uh, on our on our health. And it starts really even from when you're indoors, when, when you've got views of uh, greenery outside of your window, if you've got a balcony or a garden outside, uh, and you can just see that, there's been studies to show that that patients who are who are unwell in hospital actually recover faster with the same conditions, they recover faster uh, if they've got an outdoor green uh, space outside that they can see, so be it trees, be it some form of greenery, nature, woodland, uh, than those who don't have that. And on average, they were sent home uh, well enough to go home a day earlier. So even without going outdoors, you can reap the benefits of the outdoors by being inside. So that relates to some of what Ruth was saying, because we have found people, you know, particularly with the coronavirus, people who have been shielding people with OCD where their symptoms have certainly got worse when they've, you know, all this idea about washing your hands and hygiene, which is so, so important for keeping the coronavirus under control, uh, can really lay into the fears and the behaviours of people with OCD and, and, and really, you know, make that worse because they often link their OCD with hygiene and repetitive kind of cleaning behaviours. Uh, and, and people who have been shielding really, you know, haven't been able to go outside, but they can reap some of that benefit from just looking outside onto green spaces if they've got, uh, if they've got that, that going for them. But once you are outdoors, you know, usually we are more active when we're outdoors, so that's better for our cardiovascular health. Uh, being outdoors with nature has actually shown to reduce your levels of obesity, type 2 diabetes. Uh, uh, and it can help reduce anxiety and stress, uh, usually alongside conventional medical treatment as well. It's, it's fair to say that you mustn't just use nature as your treatment options. If things aren't improving, you, you, you should seek medical help as, uh, as, as well. But it goes beyond that, you know, just simply being out in sunlight. We know sunlight is great for vitamin D, which has a role in protecting you uh, against covid uh, but also sunlight is good for your immune system. Uh, so being outdoors when the sun is shining, and we've had some lovely warm weather, helps boost your immune system, which in turn may be of some benefit for any infections and, and possibly even, even COVID. Looking ahead of that, really, you know, people with existing conditions, things like dementia, we know when older people who have early dementia uh, go outdoors and are involved in activities outdoors, it can actually slow down the progression of, of their disease. So there's loads of benefit there as, as well. Uh, and I want to link into what Ruth was saying. What's really important to me in all of this, you know, with COVID, without COVID, is, is access to nature for all. Uh, and one of the reasons I feel I, you know, compelled to be uh, active in, in green prescribing and, and being vocal about the benefits of nature is, is I want people to see people who look like them 
out in nature and doing things uh, and, and, and realise that it is beneficial to, to, to everyone. And it's not necessarily about being people, but about class as well. Class can, uh, social class can often be a barrier to accessing these spaces. And, and, and I think that's really important to try and balance out somewhere along the lines. Um, as a doctor, during this whole coronavirus uh, pandemic, we're still in it. I, I'm not talking about it in the past tense. Uh, it, it, it has been a strain on, on my mental health uh, uh, because, you know, going into to what we would what we call red hubs, where we treat patients with coronavirus symptoms was very stressful, particularly being of a BAME background myself and knowing that I'm at higher risk. Uh, watching my nursing home patients who I've looked after for years and years and years die from coronavirus was very, very upsetting. Uh, and it still gets me upset when I talk about it. Um, but um, what really helped me uh, uh, was, was coming home, uh, going into the garden uh, before I even went indoors. Because when I went indoors, you know, it was like a full wash. You have to strip, you have to wash. You know, that was all part of the stress. But before I did that, I'd go into the garden and I'd look into the pond and I'd count the frogs in the pond and that would really calm me down. And I know everybody's been talking about listening to the birds, but listening to the birds being brilliant uh, and going for walks out, outside or going for my runs in the morning in, in nature has, has been absolutely phenomenal. And I, and I tell this story a lot, but I think it's so poignant. And I'll, so I'll say it again. There was one particular case where I had been to a nursing home uh, and uh, a patient who, who I've been lucky enough to look after for the last 10 years uh died uh from coronavirus i went to, to I'd, I'd seen them during the illness and i went to verify the death uh and i came back and i was it was just so upsetting because they were relatively well before the virus and they you know they, they had a good quality of life and and they weren't allowed to have their family members around them during the death and it was just awful uh and i remember coming out into my car and and, and sitting in the car and and just being really, really upset, really stressed, really angry, uh, all of these kind of emotions. And a robin flew onto the bonnet of my car and I just kind of watched it and it looked at me and then it flew into a bush uh, nearby and came back out. And then it did that a few more times. And, and as I watched it, uh, it was building a nest. Uh, and I must've watched it for about five or six minutes. And during those five or six minutes, I didn't think about what had happened to me just before that moment. Uh, and that is the power of nature. It can it can distract you. It can pull you out of of you know some of the darkest times of your life. And and that is just my experience in a, in a few moments. But that can it can be really beneficial to to people who are going through very stressful times. Uh, it might just offer them that brief respite from from whatever it is that they're going through and and bring them out of it, uh, even for a few moments, which was so valuable for me. Uh, so yeah, I'm a really uh, big advocate for green prescribing. I really believe it works. Uh, and I've seen the evidence both on a large scale and on a personal scale, which is why I talk about it a lot. Amir, thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. um, before we move on, I'd, I'd love to just ask you one question myself, if I can. Is it, I'm, I'm interested whether you've any ever detected any scepticism, either from your colleagues uh, in your profession around this agenda, or indeed perhaps from some of your patients? And how have you I dealt think... with that? So. Yeah, I, um, my colleagues are pretty good, to be fair. Uh, you know, everybody understands the benefits of nature, particularly if you've been, you know, most of us have been out in nature and, you know, no one will argue that it is a nice experience. No one will argue that. Uh, however, you know, when patients come to you, uh, you know, when they come and see their doctors, you know, they're, they're, either, they're either expecting a discussion and a, and a diagnosis or some form of treatment in the form of pills or, you know, a referral somewhere. It doesn't have to, you know, something like that. Uh, and when I suggest to them, uh, you know, part of this management could involve you, you know, going out for more walks, being more mindful of the things around you. There is, there's not, scepticism I don't think is the right word, but I, I think they, they do need some convincing and explaining as to why that is beneficial to them. But those of them who do it, you know, it's easy for me to say it to the type 2 diabetics, to the cardiovascular disease patients, because it, it involves the exercise as well as being outdoors. Uh, but when I'm talking about mental health, you know, those people, are, it's very hard for them to be motivated to do a lot of things because part of their illness is lack of motivation. Uh, uh, but, but when they do 
eventually get to a point where they feel they can do that. They do reap the benefits. And I must say, you know, for very mild mental health conditions, it, 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 it can be the only thing that can help. But with moderate and severe things, it's alongside other conventional methods of treatment as well. So it, it might not be the only thing they, they have, but it's in conjunction with lots of other things that may be helping them. Great, Amir. Thank you very much. Well, I know, Amir, you've been a, 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 an enthusiastic participant in the Wildlife Trust Initiative 30 Days Wild that we've been running for five years now. For people that don't know, 30 Days Wild is an initiative where we just encourage everyone to do something that consciously connects them with nature uh, at least once a day, every day in June. And it's been uh, immensely, uh, enormously successful with a huge number of people getting involved. And this year we've broken all records. This year we've had 136,000 people over that register uh, to get involved uh, in 30 Days Wild. Uh, that involves 118,000 uh, families, uh, nearly 16,000 schools, 1,400 care homes, and uh, just over 1,000 businesses that have all registered to get involved in 30 Days Wild this year. And it's, of course, just coming to an end uh, as we come to the end of June, although we do encourage people to continue it after this as well. Uh, so it's been wonderfully successful, but I know, Amir, you've been tweeting pictures of your own experiences and, and involvement in 30 Days Wild uh, during, during June, and I think we're going to show some of your photos now, um, hopefully. Sorry, Fabian. Oh, we don't have them available. Sorry. sorry. Oh, sorry. I thought we were going to show some. <laughs> That's my fault. Uh, but there were lots of, I, I, you know, on my Twitter account, that you, there, there is lots of pictures of, because it's been spring and through the summer, you know, lots of pictures of cygnets and ducklings and herons and frogs and bees, you know, it, it, things that we could all, nothing, you know, exotic, nothing fancy, uh, but things that we can all see if we just venture outdoors. And that's, that's the beauty of it. It's just the everyday nature rather than, you know, you don't have to go anywhere too far away to see this stuff. Just sitting in your garden and, and really enjoying nature is uh, part of it. So it's, yeah, fantastic. So do look at Amir's Twitter feed if you want to see some of those photos. Um, but we're going to move now to hearing more about the brilliant initiative of the Lancashire Wildlife Trust over the last few years, an initiative called My Place. And much as I could introduce it, we actually have a video to uh, introduce the uh, initiative before we hear more from Rhoda and Connor. So uh, let's hear from that video. If you have got mental health issues and you feel like you want to do something but scared, come and do it because it's amazing. working on my place is a magical really kind of magical experience I quite often meet people um, early on in the project before they've even come along we'll kind of stop and um, just tidy it up a bit. take a little time with people before they have to kind of come and meet the group and people will quite often turn up quite nervous maybe a little anxious about the um, about the prospect of coming and meeting new people and to see them kind of flourish in a really positive environment over a period, either, either, either weeks or a few months, is really, really exciting to see. Skills and pills only get you so far. If you're doing everything right, but you're inside, you're not getting fresh air, you're not connected with the world. So I guess with a project like this, it gets young people feeling really, really connected to making change and having a part of the world, feeling like they can influence change. You're gonna feel better because you're helping somebody else and you're helping the environment. So you can see from that video it's been a fantastic initiative by the Lancashire Wildlife Trust over these last few years and so I'm delighted therefore that we are joined this afternoon by Rhoda who was instrumental in running that initiative, and then Connor, who started as a participant, but now is involved in running it as well. Um, let's hear from Rhoda, uh, well, actually, let's hear from Connor, first of all. Uh, and Connor, uh, invite you to tell us about your own experience of being a participant of this, and then we'll hear from Rhoda. Connor. Hello, hello. Uh, so we'll start at the beginning, uh, back in, I think it was 2017 now, which 
feels like yesterday time has absolutely flown by um and before i'd even got involved with the project i was suffering quite heavily with mental health with depression anxiety and stuff like that um it got to a point where i was only leaving the house once once every two weeks and that was just to go to the job center um and in the well, on one particular day i went to the job center there was some people in there from a project called my place and i don't know what it was on that particular day but i built up the courage to go and have a chat with them found out a little bit about the project and i did generally like being outside when when i was really young anyway so i think the thing was with me i lost that connection with nature um so i had a chat with them booked um my say booked a uh, had a chat with them about when I could join a session, where was the nearest session I could join, which funnily enough, it was the Grange, which was in the video that you've just watched. Um, so I joined the, <clears throat> I joined the session uh, on Fridays and it was um, incredibly helpful for me just because from my perspective, from dealing with my own mental health issues, I, um, I could talk to people like close friends, family, but because they hadn't experienced what I'd experienced, I didn't really seek much help with with friends and family. But when I joined the uh, the My Place project, I felt it was I was around like minded people, uh, people who understood where I was coming from when I said, "Oh, I'm I'm feeling this way," and they can go, "Yes, I know exactly what you mean because I'm feeling that." Um, so I was on the project for. Well, well, obviously still I'm on the project uh, as a participant. And then I decided as I was, you know, still going to these sessions every week that I wanted to do a bit more. My, my confidence was increasing. I was getting that connection back with nature and it was slowly but gradually, it made me feel so much better. I have like confidence, I, just everything as a whole. It's difficult to put into words of what this has actually done for me personally. Um, but it's, it's just incredible. So from there, I moved on to being a volunteer. So I would uh, volunteer on a session on Wednesdays. It was Wednesdays, wasn't it? It was Wednesdays um, at Evening Park. And that carried on for, well, a, quite a, a little bit, maybe time for a little bit. And then the opportunity arose to become a My Place trainee. And that is what I'm doing right now. And it's absolutely incredible. The team are amazing. Absolutely amazing. Connor, thank you very much. So Rhoda, over to you. So Connor's given you a kind of good introduction to kind of um, my place, um, but in practice, it started um, just, just over four years ago now, and it's a partnership between Lancashire Wildlife Trust and Lancashire and South Cumbria NHS Foundation Trust. And it was really a combination of the two organisations thinking that there are similar to kind of the um, comments that have been made by Amir and Ruth that there is there are different options to approaching kind of well-being and a holistic well-being for all and everybody will know that um, well uh, your well-being can be improved by connection to nature but what my place seeks to do really is to support those people who are furthest away from having that or accessing that connection to nature similar to kind of um, the comments you've heard by Connor there um, and supporting them to gradually start in a supportive small group environment to really start to kind of build that connection to nature. So, um, and we did that through funding through the lottery and the European Social Investment Fund um, and built um, really strong referral pathways with a whole variety of different people. So mental health teams, social prescribers and GPs, local authorities, all sorts of different things along those lines. Um, and have built a really dynamic um, exciting kind of project that supports people to, who might not ordinarily ever think about kind of coming along to the Wildlife Trust to come along and start to kind of build that knowledge and experience and confidence to connect with nature in really small ways. Again, similar to kind of what Mir was saying, that it doesn't have to be kind of a really glamorous and exotic kind of um, set of things that you might find. It can be as simple as um, growing your own um, fruit and vegetables in, your, in a local green space. It could be going out, taking kind of nature walks and having a bit more of an understanding of what you're seeing and confidence about how you'd find out a bit more about what you're seeing, that physical kind of activity, connecting similar again to what Connor was saying about people who, connecting with people who've got a shared interest and a common interest and all of those different things 
So it's been um, it's an, been an amazing project. We've worked so far with over thirteen hundred people, and the things that people tell us are, again are kind of that um, it provides them with a sense of connection to both um, nature and um, people and their communities. It, there's an element of calm, getting physically active as well. But I, I think a really important thing for people um, has been that they've been part of um, nature's recovery as well. So it's not just us doing something to somebody and it's not a clinical offer where they, you sat down kind of analysing kind of what, what else could happen and worrying about the past or the future. You're very much present and in that moment and taking direct action for nature. Um, and in a way that is enabling you to feel much more confident in yourself and kind of what what you've got to what you've got to offer, really. But yeah, it's been it's been an amazing project, and we're at the moment we're looking with there's always kind of demand for kind of more of that. So we're kind of working um, to develop that in Greater Manchester as well, and Merseyside, and all of all over the, our kind of trusts offer. And at the moment, one of the things that Connor's been amazing with at the moment is looking at kind of how we support people and um, in terms of the digital offer as well. So during COVID, where we've not been meeting face to face, there's been an opportunity to really look at where we could be as a project as well. So we're, we're running a lot of kind of online sessions as well at the moment. So, yeah, it's been, it's been a fantastic project to be part of. Fantastic, Rhoda. Thank you very much. And I know you've got uh great ambitions for how you can expand the scheme in the future as well so it's just it's brilliant how it keeps uh how it's going from strength to strength uh so that's us hearing a little bit about you know the work of uh, lancashire wildlife trust in, in one area uh, we're going to hear now from dom higgins who's the head of health and education at the wildlife trust a bit more about that initiative i was talking about before 30 days wild and just actually some of the sort of academic research that's been telling us about just the impact that's had over the last five years. Over to you, Dom. Thank you, Craig. And it's uh, it's been absolutely inspirational uh, listening to, to Connor and Rhoda there. Um, and if it's a privilege to be at sort of the centre of 46 organisations uh, who have that kind of transformative impact, that's one story. I know you've reached well over 1,500 people in Lancashire. You just timed that up and you get a sense of the scale. of If we delivered health a little bit differently in this country, what a difference we could actually make, not only within the Wildlife Trust, but across our sector. You know, the potential is huge. And, and if you're talking about transformative impact, then 30 Days Wild, uh, you mentioned it earlier, Craig, we've been helping people to do, get involved in random acts of wildness every day in June. We do it every year. Um, at the start of uh, uh, this particular campaign, we published a report uh, from the University of Derby, and it looked at five years worth of data of 30 days wild, somebody just taking notice of nature every day, um, or having a coffee outside, or going for a walk and stepping away from their, uh, their desk. And this research found two really important things. One, it improved our health, our well-being and our levels of happiness. Um, but it also improved our sense of nature. They call it nature connectedness, but actually our feeling of nature. Um, and Ruth was talking very much about the challenges that people have faced during this time. Um, so if our health and well-being improves by a, a certain amount within 30 days while, well, the research showed that those effects last for at least two months. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is it affected those the most who had the least connection with nature to start with, those with the sort of lowest levels of mental well-being. And so that tells us really, if we could have a transformative impact with a, with a campaign, this is it, because you can reach people who perhaps don't know nature, but also reach those who, who feel uh, sort of lowest at the start of the campaign. And so as well as all the joy that it brings and and, and the fantastic stories. There was a wonderful blog from 10 care homes, one person's experience supporting those 10 care homes of, you know, sort of people who were eating outside, people who were just taking their shoes and socks off and feeling the grass under their feet, writing poetry. Um, you know, you talked about the cognitive benefits. So um, it, it's been an absolute joy. Uh, and But those are really important findings. And 
Amir mentioned prescribing before. So, um, you know, if we're looking at this kind of community based approach to health and well being and trying to sort of engage people in what matters to them. We know from poll after the poll that people really care about nature, people care about the environment. So if you combine what matters to them and what, what really matters to them, and also with, with some of the engagement that, that, that Rhoda and Connor have just described, you know, the effect is really, really powerful. And um, I think essentially the other point I'd really like to pick up on is something that Amir and Ruth have mentioned, and this is about access and equality. Um, so we have spoken about doorstep nature. We have to recognize, I think, that not everybody has this. And so one of the first things that we have to do is bring nature back. We have to restore nature so that everybody can get that on their doorstep because um, the stats are out there. It shows if you live in a wealthier area, you're nine times more likely to have green space on your doorstep of a higher quality and it's just not good enough. So there's a really important bit of legislation going through the environment bill. And within that is a nature recovery network. That is how we will make a difference to people's lives. That's what we can do together to bring nature back. Um, I'd like to just introduce another video. Uh, and this is from Warwickshire Wildlife Trust and their fantastic partnership with MIND locally. And I think this just goes to show what you can achieve uh, if you listen to some of the personal testimony and, and what people say about nature and their own well-being. I suffer with anxiety and depression. So I was thinking about dark places like suicide and stuff. And since Country Mind and Watch the Wildlife Trust come together, I heard about the team through the Recovery Academy. To learn loads of stuff about the environment and how important it is for people. Um, I think the first time I came, it was a bit difficult actually getting out of bed first of all, getting in the car, driving here. I sort of sat in the car for a bit and I was like, oh, do I go? Do I sort of pretend that I couldn't make it? The, the team, they're absolutely perfect people, honestly. They do so much hard work. But by the third session, I was jumping out of the car early and hanging around by the gate for everyone else to turn up. I am a volunteer, a key member and a buddy for the team. Uh, I'm here today on a bushcraft day. The bushcraft courses have done a lot of good with people. I think it's an excellent way to learn about nature and how to survive in nature in a way, in a little way, like, not in no SAS way, like. I think it's a really good experience for anyone. I've done things like Viking knitting, I've learned about fire lighting. Like today, you wouldn't expect it to be sunny, but it just comes through and it makes everything look so different. It's really nice. <laughs> this has got me to learn loads of stuff. It's affected um, affect me so positively. My parents, my family have noticed the difference. They say now the children look at now and are happy. I've found a new appreciation for the environment and it's done a lot for the team. You know, it's given me confidence to be a buddy so I can talk to people and see that they're doing okay. I'm a city girl and in terms of my mental health it's made me a lot more confident. I've made friends, I've made new friends today which is even better. I just think of the positive things I can do. It just feels perfect. Absolutely perfect it feels. So fabulous video there and it's worth saying that we actually had uh, 
staff and, and leaders from the uh, NHS England come and visit that project in Warwickshire, the, 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 exactly the people at the NHS that are exploring social prescribing and green prescribing. So we were very pleased to be able to host them at that uh, project. Um, uh, I'm just going to get into a couple of questions to Amir quickly, because I know, Amir, you have to leave in about five, ten minutes, unfortunately, to get a train. Yeah, I'm getting a train from London back up to Leeds. So, right, yes, okay. so we're better let you go and do that. But a couple of questions that have come in from participants, and I want to just fire them at you before you go, if we can. Uh, one mm. question from Anne Cox. Uh, what happens inside my body that lifts my heart when I enter deciduous woodland? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, and it affects all of us, really. So when you're in any kind of outdoor space, be it a woodland or uh, a green area, really, uh, the first thing, you know, is your senses will pick that up. So you, you'll smell, uh, if you're in a woodland, you'll pick up those smells. The sunlight will hit your skin and that will set off some chemical reactions. You get the visual response as well. And all of that works together to stimulate what we call neurotransmitters. And these are uh, uh, chemical messages essentially that transmit messages from nerve to nerve and tell your brain that something really nice and happy is happening uh, and and you get things like dopamine serotonin all of these are happy related neurotransmitters uh, that tell your brain i'm really enjoying this i love these senses whatever's going on around me is having a positive effect on my mental health and my physical well-being uh, and that's that feeling that makes your heart sing as as uh, uh, and described it there and, and it is it is very lovely and 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 yeah so so that's exactly what happens when you go outdoors thank you so question amir from polly howes so are given the science you've just explained to us i mean the question is are gps actively prescribing going out into nature and perhaps volunteering to improve people's mental and physical well-being so although we know about the benefits of nature and the health uh, effects that that it has uh, there is no real formal way for every single GP across the country to, to prescribe green spaces. We can certainly advise it uh, as part of our treatment options, uh, and we can discuss various organisations like the Wildlife Trust that, that may be able to help. We're not formally prescribing it just yet. Some practices are. There are some practices who are part of trials that are doing that, but not every single GP surgery is, but we would certainly advise it. And a lot of us do advise rather than prescribe. But Ruth, think, we know it doesn't just have yeah. to be GPs anyway, does it? Yeah, no, that's right. I think it's really important. This is something we can all do for ourselves and for others. And actually volunteering, giving to others is one of those things that makes us feel good about ourselves. If you know somebody, maybe they can't talk at this point, but they could go for a walk. And you just in times of difficulty, just stand outside and take some deep breaths. You know, it's really great when um, GPs are prescribing these things, but it is something that we can all do for ourselves and others as well. Great. Thank you, Ruth. Well, I know, as I said, Amir's got to uh, depart. Amir, we've been delighted to have you be able to join us this afternoon. Thank you so much for that. And thanks, of course, for being here. Uh, uh, ambassador for the Wildlife Trust. We're delighted to have you. And I know just as you're going to leave, we're, we're, we're actually going to show one of your brilliant videos, Five Natural Ways to Wellbeing uh, with Dr. Amir Khan. But Amir, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Cheers, guys. See ya. A natural approach to health has been shown to improve our mental and physical well-being. We all lead busy lives and it's hard to fit it in sometimes, but getting outdoors and being with nature can have a profound effect on all of us and make us happier and healthier. So how can the Wildlife Trust help? Through five evidence-based ways that can improve our overall well-being. Go for a gentle walk in your local park or nature reserve. Increasing your activity levels by even a small amount can prevent a range of illnesses. Wildlife Trust provides safe and social activities that you can do at your own pace. You'll get used to a routine of green exercise and you'll start to notice the things around you, the small wonders of nature, hearing a bird, seeing a flower poke through a wall, just being in the moment. All of this is great for your mental well-being. So now you've started connecting with your natural surroundings. Getting that peace and quiet is great, but being socially connected to other people is really important too. The impact of loneliness on our physical and mental well-being 
can be huge. Your local wildlife trust has a range of activities that you can try, from regular volunteering to going on an organised walk around a nature reserve. And there's plenty of time to socialise, grab a cup of tea and catch up with friends. Keeping the brain active has all sorts of benefits. There's always new things to learn about nature, from getting to know your local wildlife to picking up new tips on growing flowers and herbs in your garden or window boxes. There's really no limit to the benefits of learning new things and the joy it brings into our lives. Getting all this benefit from nature is great, but you're also helping your local wildlife and wild spaces to recover and thrive. This feels good and gives us purpose. They'll just point out the things that they know, it's like that trees. That's an oak tree, that's a yew tree, uh, this is a trefoil, this is sorrel, you can eat the leaves and it was just like, I learned so much on my first day. I've been dealing with cancer and also uh, last year, uh, very suddenly I lost my wife, so I, I, I was very down and uh, depressed and getting involved with this is very important to me. Nature is amazing, uh, you can lose yourself in nature. That's a medicine itself, I think. The benefits are uh, just enormous, aren't they? Okay, so uh, thanks again to Dr. Amir Khan. Uh, but we still have, I'm delighted to say, on the panel, Dom Higgins, who's the head of uh, health and education at the Wildlife Trust. We have Ruth Sutherland, chief executive of the Samaritans. And we have Rhoda and Connor, who are both from the Lancashire Wildlife Trust and have been working on that brilliant project that we've been talking about uh, this afternoon. So we're straight into the Q&A now. And remember, you can put questions in live through the chat box on YouTube and uh, we'll try and get through as many as possible and actually we've had a huge number come in this afternoon already many more than we can do but i'll try and get through as many as we possibly can uh, there's one question we got from mike boys uh, which and there's many questions that are along this theme uh, there's been much talk of a new normal uh, following you know coronavirus and the lockdown a new normal that will benefit nature and wildlife after the lockdown but actually as the restrictions slowly but surely are being lifted uh, there's actually little evidence of that coming into practice. So let's put it to the panel here to discuss that a little bit. Um, Dom, do you see a new normal emerging or is it just something that we can hope for and is not going to happen? Well, I think, you know, sort of lockdown and social distancing, you know, has shown people's desire uh, for uh, nature and you know anecdotally you you hear of people all the time finding I didn't know this was behind me you know it was five minutes walk from my house those sorts of things so there is definitely this this kind of thirst and this this kind of need I also think that um, there's reason to be positive from everybody going out it's quite easy to go to the headlines and look at the litter and look at those sorts of things but actually looking past that you know people actually want to go out be in a group to Ruth's point earlier, uh, and be outside. And those are fundamental things. So I think if we are to make it better and different, then I think what we really need to do is work with kind of some of these national bodies, like there's a National Academy of Social Prescribing, which is really supposed to embed that across the health sector uh, in terms of the natural environment. And I think we need to just make sure that that is, is that we work in partnership with them and that what we deliver, the programmes that Rhoda and other, uh, others uh, are running, are actually properly resourced but embedded in the system. And that way we can actually sort of change the way that, that people interact with the health system, I would say. I think I'd add into that as well that the normal that we had was actually making us sick and it was making the environment sick and it was making us sick. And this is an opportunity to actually rethink a lot of the things we do, like how we work, how we how, what we do at home. I think there is going to be a clamour of people uh, wanting to move out of cities or making cities greener and um, organising our houses in a way that we're actually engaging more with the outside. I think more of us are going to grow things to eat. I think we've become a lot more interested in where food comes from. 
And so the whole notion, and I thought Connor and Rhoda really brought this out well about recovery. Recovery doesn't necessarily mean restore. It means to do better. And that we've got that opportunity now to do better and live in a healthier society. Um, and that's the opportunity that we have now. For me, I think that we should be aiming for kind of better than normal, really. And there's a challenge there for all of us. Um, and instead of just kind of herring straight back to what Ruth is kind of quite accurately saying, it uh, was a society that was making people ill. Um, it's an opportunity to take a moment and have a think about kind of what was it that we loved about the, our previous life, but actually where do we want to be? And with a blank sheet of paper, where would you choose to be? Because it's a rare moment in time to kind of take a pause and have a think about the future that we would like to have. collectively. And that's, that's certainly kind of what I see us doing as a project and kind of looking at, so one of the things that we've been able to do to kind of come back again to Ruth's earlier point um, during lockdown, because we've kept working as a team during lockdown is, we've re reached a kind of much more diverse set of people because people haven't physically had to get out on the reserve and all of those different things. So and we're pushing ourselves to kind of look at how can we make it even more local so that we don't have to use transport and all of those different things, which is environmentally kind of better, but she brings us more and more and more closer to kind of communities and really kind of starts to strengthen um, the degree of diversity that we have. So if we choose to take it, there are real kind of potentials, but there's a challenge to every single one of us really to kind of make that happen. Connor, what do you see is that yourself that, you know, your experiences through lockdown and opportunities for sort of a, a new normal or a better normal, as Ruth put it there, uh, after lockdown? Uh, well, if anything, I think that the lockdown has, um, it's, it is inspiring somewhat of change for a prime example would be, um, as Don was saying, with the litter. Um, with the, the whole lockdown, nobody's been going out, nobody has been littering, but the uh, prime example with uh, with um, Blackpool and the, the football grounds and covered in litter, which obviously it wasn't before people attended there, it's bringing more light to a current issue that we have with the environment being obviously littering. Uh, so there will be a change and people are starting to go, oh, hang on a minute, why are we still doing this then? Like We like the look of it before the litter, what's going on? Like, it's just encouraging more of a change. Yeah, great. Thank you. So we had a really interesting question from Viola Marks uh, this afternoon. Um, how do you best convince patients that they should get involved in nature based interventions? I suppose, I mean, for any of you, really, but I, I suppose particularly, uh, I don't know, Ruth and Rhoda, I suppose you particularly interested in your perspective on this. But what if there's resistance from the very people that would benefit from it most? Mm -hmm. how, how do you deal with that? How do you work through that? Well, I think it is important to recognise that this, there are benefits for everybody. You know, it is. Uh, we know that there are benefits from people who, um, you know, are, are, who are living with a, a, a mental illness of some kind. But as I said earlier, you know, we all have mental health and, you know, anxiety, stress, depression in, a, in the milder forms are things that we all um, experience. So I think for, to start with, how we engage people in is that we all do it. It's not something just for a group of people. Um, it's something that we all benefit from and we all do we build it into our lives. So reducing any kind of stigma that might be associated, I think, is, is a really important um, thing. But also to just start small. I mean, if I, I um, tell you an example of somebody I knew who, um, who I met through Samaritans who was suffering um, or living with a, a real a deep depression, and their climbing out of that situation started with a spider and watching a spider um, and that they couldn't do anything else. They couldn't move. They couldn't do anything. It started like that. Then there was the thing about a seed and growing something, just starting to grow one thing. And then the description was, and then they said, as they got more and more into it, suddenly the trees were green again. And the world, the world had been in monochrome for them. And, um, but the, the opening up of the possibilities and then starting to feel optimistic, starting to feel that there was a future, uh, the seasons bringing new things. Um, so I think it's about being really incremental and starting really small and where the person is at, not making the bar too high that it means that it's not accessible. So how do you get alongside that person 
be with them wherever they are and just try and introduce something that starts to open up a bit of possibility. Yeah, I think there's a lot, there's a lot to that um, in terms of kind of simplicity and just making things as easy and accessible as you possibly can, really, which is partly kind of our rational. So uh, uh, while some of our delivery is, is on our nature reserves, we do a lot in kind of local spaces. And at the moment, we're very much kind of actively supporting people to do stuff in whatever green space that they've got, really. Um, but the, the kind of short answer is patience and kindness. and determination and consistency really it's um the reason we have a specialist team to, that focuses on this for the people who are furthest away from um connection to nature and well-being is because it, it it's challenging to ask somebody it's all well and good saying you will be better if you go outside but if you if you haven't left the house for kind of six months or years and years and years to 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 kind of go outside to find your cure and kind of come along to kind of meet a new group of people however positive and kind of welcoming they may be is is a challenging thing to kind of ask of somebody so yeah patience consistency kindness and positivity and it roots right to to be living it and to kind of be living that um to be living that life yourself really i think um some of the some of the kind of digital stuff that we're doing at the moment we'll use to we'll use as well to um look at ways that we can kind of show people kind of what the group looks like in advance, for example, so that they're starting to see kind of before they kind of leave the house, what, what they're going to be coming to and all, all of those different things. So there's things that we'll learn from the current situation that will um, strengthen our capacity to do that. Yeah, I watched some of those, Rhoda. Those are amazing sort of videos on YouTube that was introducing people to the group before they kind of came. Uh, we've actually had a question from Jackie Sellers who said, could green buddies help individual patients green walk together uh, so that people feel that they can do it together and so on? Um, Dom, Connor, any other thoughts here about how to, how to make it as easy as possible for people to get involved in this that might feel that there's that that hurdle to start with? Connor? Uh, like Rhoda said, it's the it, it's the uh, patients with it. If you, let's say there's a participant who would really benefit from him, but you're encouraging them too much to the point where they feel like they're forced to join the project if anything it'll have more of a negative impact more than a positive one mm. uh, even if they enjoy everything about it they love going but because it wasn't their sole choice and they're being somewhat pushed to join it it would just be create a negative bubble around it which obviously is the exact opposite of what we want so yeah like Rhoda said a lot of just patience yeah, yeah. And we already heard from Amir how there might be issues about uh, race or class in their ethnicity and so on, which is very important as well to, to consider. Dom? Yeah, no, no, I was just going to add, Craig, that, that I totally agree with everybody. And it's the question to ask is, is what matters to you rather than what's the matter with you? And that's what's driving the changes uh, that we're seeing in the health system and listening. Uh, and it may well be, we might not want to hear it, well, just that people are not into what we're into and that's fine. Um, there's so much you can do in the outside uh, uh, or, or with a wildlife trust or with a similar organization that might not be the sort of, you know, um, hands dirty wildlife kind of this is what I, you know, so it's important to ask that question. What is it that, 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 that fires you up? What, and take some time. It may take two or three times. And after that, you can just build an experience together with that person. Uh, and it could be all about being active and just getting the heart rate up and just, you know, doing jogging somewhere rather than actually going out and joining a volunteering group. But it's, you know, it's it's important to listen. Yeah. Well, and what about in, in the sort of company sphere, in the corporate sphere, Dom? Uh, we've had a question from Rachel Cook. As an HR professional, how can we use local wildlife trust to work alongside companies, bringing nature to life and helping our teams get out? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And there's a there's a really um, important report that um, our friend Paul Farmer uh, from Mind and Lord Stevenson uh, put together. Uh, and it was looking at the impact of mental ill health and uh, uh, on, on the workplace and uh, on the economy as a whole. And there are some really eye-watering stats in there about the number of people that lose their job with poor mental health or that carry on working uh, with poor mental health and it just you know that's no good for anybody it's no good for the company it's no good for the person um, 
And so um, our approach to that, our answer will be our sort of wild well-being days, really. And it's, you saw the film from Amir. There are five evidence-based ways to improve your well-being, which, which look at your, how you function and how you feel. And if you address all of those, you become more productive, you become happier. Um, and actually you become a lot more happy with the place you're working and more effective. So I would say if you address those five ways to well-being, do them in nature um, and, um, and, and you will function and feel better. So, yeah, I'd say that. Yeah, and I, I think I'd add that one about the, the one about giving, you know, that volunteering is very good for us. Employees who volunteer are happier, healthier, more engaged with their employer. But the uptake of corporate volunteering schemes is really low. So I think that's down to us, the providers, is to be more creative about how we can fit in with how people live and work and make volunteering possible so that it's meaningful because the, a lot of the volunteering that does go on in the corporate sphere isn't very meaningful for people. You know, it might be litter picking or something like that. Do you get more health benefit when you're actually engaged with the cause and the task? So how do we make that possible? I think that's one of the challenges that we have. But corporate volunteering is a really great way to improve of the company as well as in the individuals in it. And this will be interesting to hear from you, Rhoda and Con, on this, because, you know, the distinction I guess we're making here as well is the difference from being just in nature uh, to working in nature. And actually, we had a question from Christopher Baker along these lines. There's, there's a lot of uh, there's been a lot of discussion of how being in nature helps with mental well-being. Have there been any studies into how working with nature affects our well-being and the sort of difference between the two? And I just wonder what have been your observations, Rhoda, on the road on Connell and the difference of that through the My Place project? I think there's, there's that element of, um, so what people kind of tell us if via, um, so people who've been through uh, traditional um, mental health therapy um, and have also kind of uh, worked alongside us as volunteers and participants will say that there's a, there's a kind of difference really between um, sitting in a room discussing what you could do um, on what has gone wrong to actually being physically out working um, to support nature's recovery because you, you there's a there's a sense of actually kind of practically kind of putting something to, into action and a, a feeling of being part of something so if you're kind of volunteering or working with the wildlife because you're part of a kind of national movement of people who are working towards um, a collective aim got a massive kind of set of volunteers alongside you who um, there's that degree of passion to kind of make a make a real change and impact um, and there's a sense, sense of pride and um, so I th so I think again some of the kind of frustrations earlier about um, do we go back to normal and you know this opportunity to kind of for things to kind of calm down and be part of kind of nature's recovery um, some of some of that kind of sense of well-being is actually um, realizing that you have got a role to play in making things better really and that actually each of us individually gardening and greening up our kind of yards or gardens during lockdown has a big massive kind of collective effort even if you're not actually physically out in nature so 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 yes I think it, it's that sense of kind of um, working to achieve achieve change really Connor might have a better answer than me. No, I think you've hit the nail on the head there, to be honest. Uh, when, uh, well, from my experience from going up from just participating in the project to volunteering in the project was when I was participating, it was more, I'm there for me, uh, per se. I'm there to improve my mental well-being. But when you move up to, let's say, being a volunteer, let's say, with the, the Wildlife Trust, you're not only there for yourself, obviously, putting yourself first, but at the same time, you're there for other people as well. It's that sense of, giving back, uh, which is probably one of the five ways to uh, well-being, uh, to give back and connect with the other people around you, which are still in the same bubble as you, but they feel like if they feel like they can come and talk to you a little bit more because you're uh, the volunteer. Uh, they feel like they can come and have a, more of a conversation with you, more than another participant, if that makes any sense. <laughs> yeah. And I guess the question, how, how young should we start? I mean, there's a big question from Paul Raymond here. 
Uh, do you think schools could play a bigger part in introducing children to nature and wildlife? And uh, Connor, what happened for you in your schooling years? You know, how, how much involvement did your school have in, in trying to build that relationship to nature? Uh, nowhere near enough. I feel like there is a big lack of um, what well, learning about nature in schools is um, I think in my primary school, this is going back quite a few years now, uh, we, we did a handful of it from what I can remember, a, a small handful of the time I was then in high school, I, I don't think we even touched on, on the subject. And I feel like to educate more people about the environmental issues that we have now, it needs to start earlier on in high schools where, uh, maybe even in primary schools, because a lot of, you know, I, I, as kids, everyone likes getting their hands muck in, either, you know, doing some weeding or planting some trees or something. Everyone likes getting involved at that age. And if you start them off younger, it gives them that that um, that sense of, oh, wow, that's, that's quite fun. Let's, let's carry on. I like this. I like this. Well, let me just come to you then, Dom. I mean, this question, do you think schools could play a bigger part in introducing children to nature? I can't possibly imagine what the answer to that question is from you. <laughs> Uh, massively, and we can, you know, so so many do do great work. But there's a really um, there's a really important program that we're running at the moment, uh, which is the government's nature friendly schools program. And um, it's obviously got its challenges right now, um, as schools have got you know a huge challenge uh, as they look to engagement going forward. Um, but really, um, what's interesting about that program is it's it's looking at schools that don't have access to nature they don't necessarily have the green grass and it's also looking at a whole school approach to mental health and well-being so it's not only the participants it's the teachers it's it's the cleaning staff it's the sort of uh, leadership team and it's that whole school approach and and tying what people are doing outside to the academic program and and, and therefore how everybody engages with the school and it's it's it means it's not that separate thing anymore. You know, I think if it was anything, I mean, my school days were a long time ago, but I think people are sort of, you know, that hippie crowd over there who are going out. Actually, what it needs to be is just what Connor was saying. It just needs to be in, in the norm at the moment. And I would say that there's a consultation out at the moment, which is, is around a natural history GCSE. You should find it and give your views. If you've got any concerns about how that subject's going to land, who's going who's gonna to teach who's going to teach it who's going to learn about it is it just going to be for the privileged get your views known just search up the consultation because it does need to be different it needs to be uh, embedded and, and just not something different my champion starting a little bit earlier than that actually um i've had four conversations with completely different unrelated groups um about young parents and and us running uh, uh, my place groups specifically for kind of young parents who are particularly wanting to kind of come together in their peers who are struggling particularly during COVID um, especially for the single parents not specifically for us to run activities for their children but for them to have a kind of collective peer support group but actually in practice by doing that and engaging those people you um, you then affect a change for a whole kind of generation from you create a whole kind of generation of really young children who come up, um, who come up with nature as part of their kind of, uh, as part of how how they kind of engage in the world. Really, so I don't think there's, I don't think you can start too early. I think that's a really important point there about, uh, but it's also related to skills. You know, helping young parents to help to make the connection. You know, you don't necessarily, if it hasn't been your own experience and if your parents haven't shown you or taken you out anywhere, you don't really know what to do. Um, and just making it easier for young parents to fit it into their life. You know, maybe starting with pram walks, you know, or whatever it takes, all the Sure Start programs, all the preschool programs that they are, they could be situated in nature. Um, and, and to do those things. But I would really agree with that. You can never start too, too young, uh, but it's a skills piece as well as a knowledge piece that's important. And, and little, little is better than nothing, is what you're saying. You know, don't, don't sort of see it as a big bar. Um, let me ask you that some people will be familiar with this book, uh, Last Child in the Woods, uh, that was produced about a decade or so ago by Richard Lube. And in that, he 
he, he talked about this thing called nature deficit disorder. Um, do you buy that? Do you think there's such a thing as that? I, I just, just, I mean, I personally don't like the term disorder in this context. I think the points being made uh, are, are really valid. And I think um, knowing nature and everything that Connor just said, um, and and as well, what Ruth is saying about, um, you know, those nature tops and getting, uh, you know, pram class outside, that's, that's critical. I, um, there is a disconnection crisis if you like we, we we've seen what happens when our relationship breaks down with nature but i think making that the disorder i think you know personally I, I like to see us put forward the, the, the positive narrative and say well here are the skills here are this kind of here's all the benefits you can get here's what's going to bring both you and nature the benefit if you kind of step into that relationship but there's some really really important points in it and i think it's about re-establishing that connection and that deeper kind of relationship comes eventually but little and often to start with and let's get it on people's doorsteps to start with and I think there is also the point about just being able to as a young person being able to roam about you know I'm it's a long time since I was a child but I'm one of eight children our parents didn't take us to places but we we went places we went mm cycled for day you know, for long journeys on our own but it's not safe we think it's not safe for children to roam and I think that that's we have to work at making it possible um, for people for children to have some independence which is why the scouts and guides and all that kind of thing are so important and yet they're things that are going to probably be under pressure you know financially um, but how do you make it possible for um, for children to just roam about? I think that that's going to be an ever important issue um, as we kind of work through COVID as well, because people have increasingly learned to be socially distant and um, to be afraid of going outside because there's a kind of um, virus kind of on the loose and all of those different things. So how, how you kind of um, start to reintroduce people positively um, in a way and that's kind of similar to all the stuff our schools doesn't isn't it so it's not necessarily that risk is a reason not to do something it's how do you learn to positively kind of manage risk and again that's kind of how how to get people outside without littering and all of those different things it's not that it's not that we shouldn't be encouraging people to do that it's how, it's how embedding that sense of kind of really po positive kind of self um, self-management really I suppose. Well there's another area I want to touch on here uh, Ruth alluded to it earlier but uh, around our food as well and you know a key part of this is getting people involved in growing their own food and we had a question from Jan Courtney uh, we need to ensure that the food we eat is grown in a way that's both good for human gut biome and good for nature so as a particular sort of aspect of this, well, one area is, is how people get involved in growing food themselves. So, you know, what have been all your experiences of, of that? And, and, you know, does that add a, a sort of another additional level that is helpful here? I mean, in terms of growing food myself, uh, it, it's honestly the, le the less said on that, probably the better. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it's one of them when um, you do, I say you do grow your own food and, not only is the um, the process of that good for obviously the wildlife out there, it's also it's a sense of uh, let's say you grow yourself in some spuds, you mash them up, you make some chips, or you do whatever with it. It's a sense of I did this, this is wicked, <laughs> and it's a sense of doing it yourself, which is it's quite mindful in itself. Just the process of watching it grow from a, a seed to a portion of chips, for example. <laughs> And I think there has been a clamour. I can't remember what the statistics are, but the, the you know we ran out of seeds at the beginning of COVID. Everyone was wanting to get seeds and to try and do things themselves. And let's hope that that keeps going. And I think people have found you can grow stuff in pots on your balcony. You can you know you don't need a massive amount of space. Um, we're going to see all the um, whether people get tons of tomatoes off their one plant that they've managed to grow. But I think that sense of connection to um, where our food comes from, reducing food miles and all of that is actually very attractive. 
and I think um, that people, um, young people particularly, are going to get inspired by all of that. It, I, I think it's been a real moment for people to stop and kind of have a look at all of those different things instead of just watching it on, um, watching people do it on the telly. It's kind of, oh, hang on a second, you've got a moment in time to kind of actually have a go at some of that. And we've been dropping off kind of packs of seeds and compost with um, some of our participants. And again, it's that kind of conversation about how um, giving people a link of kind of how how their kind of plant is growing and all of those different things. And also if you're growing things like kind of salad, and stuff like that that and herbs that grow really quickly at the moment you've got that sense of something kind of fresh um fresh and natural even if you're kind of not wanting to kind of go out to the shops all of the time um it gives you a kind of consistent source of something something fresh and kind of healthy really but i think it's been really inspiring and really exciting for people um and again if you're not connecting with people it gives you something to kind of maintain and keep an eye on each day and, and a, a little bit of kind of regularity something to care for as well it's really a positive thing great thank you well we're still having loads of comments coming through on the chat we've had uh, laura ashfield has said solid partnerships and collaborations with community groups and youth organizations uh, mental health provisions is key uh, martin felstead has said we need a nature offer from preschool through to school leaving age not just young uh, young children um, and uh, many, many other comments coming through, far too many to mention. Um, I just wanted to get into one is a little bit, uh, Elizabeth Buckley had said, um, how can we encourage a deepening of the new relationships that many citizens would have formed with local wild spaces um, as they were the only places still open for day during lockdown? So it's that point, you know, there's the kind of, there's the point there about the, what we might want from government or policymakers uh, around, uh, you know, moving forward from this point and developing a new normal that is better than what we had before. What, what can we all do to encourage that deepening of the new relationships? I mean, at the Wildlife Trust, we've seen a more than 2000% increase in the number of people looking at our wildlife webcams during lockdown. Um, how do you think we, we go forward from here? Ruth, do you want to kick off? You, you're looking like you're about to say something. Yeah, yeah, no, I was, I was just way, no, hesitating there, but yes, I think the thing is, it's about we, we've all got, a, we've all got a role here. You know, Dom's talked about some things we can do: get involved in consultations, get involved with, you, you know, your, with politics, your MPs. You know, do as much as you can as a citizen, and then do what you can in your neighbourhood. Um, I think having created a sense of community that you know we we've we've re, we've had to revisit the importance of community that wherever you live uh, whatever is in on your doorstep and around you how can you keep that going so there's a role for individuals for wildlife trusts i think it is about continuing to reach out make these important connections we've had such a fabulous example uh, given to us today but there's you know wildlife trusts all over the place who can be doing um, more of this kind of work. Um, coming mostly from the mental health and the health sector, there's so much more that can be done about joining up the sectors, you know, making sure that, um, you know, that it is, the environment stuff isn't seen as being something separate for health, you know, how we join up. There's, um, you know, lots of post uh, COVID discussions and we're not even post yet but you know lots of discussions going on how can we influence all of those different places to make sure that we get can continue to get traction uh, on all of these things one of the things that's been very reassuring i think around this difficulty where we've had to be adapting and we don't know what's happening is that nature is there you know i live in the Mourn mountains i've got the most beautiful scenery the fact that those mountains are the same as they were before covid is kind of reassuring to me but i want to make sure that all of that is there for future generations that's down to me my community to work together to make sure that we can make sure that our grandchildren and great grandchildren have those benefits that we have and that we don't lose that opportunity so we've got we're re kicking restarting uh, that moment. Go on. 
Um, yeah, so so I I just picking up on Ruth for that. I'd say just final point I would I would make is let's be um, creative and let's think differently. Um, I'm minded of a of a GP surgery uh, uh, in the East End of London down near the Dartford Tunnel called Bromley by Bow Centre, and you go there and there's not a blue sign in sight. And uh, it, you, it looks for all the world like a garden. And then you look around and there's a job search kind of uh, sort of uh, room going with loads of computers. Uh, there's a Bangladeshi women's group who are learning to cook. And then you've got somebody who's doing some pop, pop up debt advice. This is a GP surgery. And I think we could really be creative uh, in the places that we have. So not. I, there's, there's huge comfort in going back out personally to the same place every time, every day, and thinking, noticing something different. But actually, some of those places around us, some of our wildlife trust places, what are those partnerships? And how can we reach out to answer Ruth's call? How can we think differently? And who can we invite in? Which means we look different and more people get the benefit. That's what I'd like to see. So... Over to Rhoda and Connor, I'd love to hear, you know, in the last few minutes we've got the, the, with the fantastic work that Lancashire Wildlife Trust have been doing with the My Place initiative the last few years. What would be your hopes and ambitions for, for My Place for the next five years? Uh, I'd say just to carry on the way we're going, we're on, I would say we're on the, uh, the winning foot. We're, um, we're doing everything that we can, maybe to expand a bit more, see if we can get, um, well, in the next five years, well, any, anything's possible. Let, let's 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 conquer the whole of the UK. Yes, <laughs> uh, but yeah, just carry on the way we're going, and um, yeah, we're winning. <laughs> Excellent, Rhoda. So, from my perspective, um, it's it's a funny one because we've done an awful lot of work to um, to to really kind of work with as many different people as possible. So the fact that we're a health and wellbeing project, but Connor's referral came through the job centre gives you an example of just how kind of hard we've worked to kind of really be present in communities and not just sat on a nature reserve, kind of waiting for people to kind of come and come and kind of participate um, and getting the kind of same audiences we would have ever got. Um, but I think that we're really still just at the start of that journey and. Um, Interestingly, kind of a lot of the stuff that Ruth's been talking about in terms of the um, mix of communities that we work with is something that's really, really kind of high on our agenda at the moment. And we're working with a lot of different communities to see if there's ways that we can do things like um, having kind of ESOL tutors active as part of our group so that people are kind of learning English in a practical setting and all of those different things and really kind of taking um, inspiration from some of the communities that people have traveled into the UK from and some of the kind of natural features of the some of the rest of the world but also kind of again things like kind of um, young parents groups all of those different things I think that we have got a really great foundation we've um, got an amazing team of people a lot of volunteers who stayed with the project as peer mentors um, but there's there's always so much more you could do so really for me it's about kind of taking um some of the kind of um some of the learning of the last kind of few months really and and melding that with the experience that we'd already had to kind of build a much more robust offer for that kind of really kind of reaches a much broader audience great well i think it's been a uh fantastic conversation this afternoon and it, and I really get a sense that with the work that's being done at Lancashire Wildlife Trust with on, on my place with work going on wide across the wildlife trusts and in other organizations uh you know it's only really we just only just started on what is this huge huge journey I mean it's incredibly important and we're very proud of what we've done already but there's just so much more to be doing and the evidence is really clear as we've heard from Ruth, as we've heard from Amir, just how incredibly important uh, access to nature is and contact and involvement in nature and working in nature is for people's physical and mental well-being. We hope you've really enjoyed the discussion this afternoon, uh, the first of these wild lives. Uh, we will be doing these every month now on a different theme and we'd love to hear from you as to what the themes are that you would like to hear discussed and suggest panel members and so on. We really want you to get involved in shaping these uh, future wild lives. So please do do that. And thank you so much for the comments and questions that we've been having all afternoon. 
many more than we could ever get through, but it's been fantastic to see them and see that level of engagement. But really for me, uh, as we finish this, this very first one, I just want to thank uh, massively the panelists, the people that have contributed this afternoon uh, to both Rhoda Wilkinson uh, and Connor Hudson from the My Place Initiative of Lancashire Wildlife Trust, to Ruth Sutherland, who's uh, Chief Executive of the Samaritans and a really valued member of the Council, that's the board for the Wildlife Trust as well, to Dom Higgins, our uh, Head of Health and Education at the Wildlife Trust, and of course to Dr Amir Khan, who joined us as well. And thank you to all the team, the Wildlife Trust, that have put this on. It's been a really good discussion. Do stay signed up, uh, uh, get involved in the Wildlife Trust. If you're not already involved, you can volunteer or join your local Wildlife Trust uh, and they will absolutely help you get out into nature and get the most out of nature as well. Uh, stay signed up, uh, stay wild until the next one. And uh, we hope you really enjoyed this. Uh, give us your feedback and hopefully see you for the next one in a month's time. Thank you. Thank you.